Hello and welcome to Biostat Squid. In this video, I will give you an overview of pathway enrichment analysis, which is a very useful tool for differential gene expression analysis. So let's dive in. So we all know that differential gene expression analysis is an essential step in RNA-seq downstream analysis. The goal is basically to identify differentially expressed genes, or DEGs, between two conditions. For example, you might be interested in studying the difference in gene expression between liver cells of healthy individuals and liver cells in individuals with alcoholic hepatitis. But differential gene expression analysis may return long lists of differentially expressed genes, for example, in the order of hundreds or thousands. So this is our list. How do we even start interpreting this? I mean, we could get a few students to manually search each gene individually for us, but that might take a while. Is there a better way to summarize this long list of genes and interpret hundreds of differential expressed genes at once? Well, a common approach is pathway enrichment analysis. Its name gives you a clue of what it does. It basically summarizes the long gene list to a shorter and more easily interpretable list of pathways. So instead of having a list of, I don't know, 2000 genes, you might get a list of 50 or 60 biological pathways. And of course, you can then check which genes are behind these pathways. So how does pathway enrichment analysis work? Pathway enrichment analysis needs three ingredients. First, of course, your gene list of interest. For example, a list of differentially expressed genes which you want to summarize. Second, a list of background genes. For example, all the genes in the human genome. Finally, it will take a list of gene sets. Gene sets are basically groups of related genes. We'll go a bit more into that later on. So of course, for the algorithm to know if your list has a lot of genes related to breast cancer or apoptosis or cellular respiration, you need to tell it which genes are actually involved in breast cancer, apoptosis and cellular respiration. Anyways, what we do essentially is compare our gene list to the background list to check if there are certain pathways overrepresented. This essentially tells us that our list of differentially expressed genes includes a lot of genes involved in T cell differentiation. Okay, let's go back to our example. Alcoholic liver disease um, usually involves a lot of inflammatory processes, which usually involve pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6 or IL-6. So, is there an association between our genes um, differentially expressed in alcoholic liver disease versus healthy cells and interleukin-6 production? In other words, is our list of differentially expressed genes enriched with genes involved in IL-6 synthesis pathway? To answer this question, we can build a contingency table. This will help us determine whether the fraction of genes of interest in the pathway is higher compared to the fraction of genes outside the pathway, so the background set. Okay, let's take this slowly. We have a column for differentially expressed genes and a column of non-differentially expressed genes. And then two rows for genes that are annotated as being involved in IL-6 production and genes that are not involved in IL-6 production. We'll simplify things a lot and we'll just look at 30 genes. Of those 30 genes, 15 were differentially expressed genes. And of those, 12 genes were associated with the gene ontology term interleukin-6 production. So we found that 12 out of our 15 differentially expressed genes were involved in interleukin-6 production. We could quite confidently say that our gene list is enriched with genes involved in IL-6 production. Okay, but what if there were 9 out of 15 differentially expressed genes? Hmm... 
Obviously, we need an objective statistical test to determine what is enriched and what's not. There are many methods out there, but the one that is commonly used in pathway enrichment analysis is Fisher's exact test. Now, I won't go into details in this video, but the point here is that you will obtain a p-value for interleukin-6 production, which will tell you if that pathway is overrepresented in your list of genes. If your p-value is really low, you can safely say that your list is overrepresented with genes involved in IL-6 production. In other words, IL-6 production is an important pathway in alcoholic liver disease compared to healthy liver cells. But careful, it does not mean it's upregulated. You would have to check the genes that are actually overrepresented in your list and see if they are positive or negative regulators of that pathway. Nice! So this is what pathway enrichment analysis is all about. You summarize a long list of genes to a shorter list of pathways with their p-values. Obviously, it does it not with one, but with thousands of pathways. And this brings us to a big problem. The big problem is called multiple testing. Basically, because you are repeatedly testing a lot of pathways, some pathways will get apparently significant p-values just by chance. So we might get results that are a bit unexpected or that just don't make any sense. To solve this problem, we need multiple testing correction. The most commonly used method is the benjamini hochberg correction. Now, if you're not familiar with multiple testing or would like to know more, I suggest this other video, which I will link in the description down below. In any case, enrichment tools will both test for significant enrichment and then correct for multiple testing. So, in summary, pathway enrichment analysis will take your gene list of interest and compare it to a list of background genes to check if there are certain pathways overrepresented. So, it checks the fraction of your genes annotated to a specific gene ontology term. And then it checks the proportion of genes in your background set, so in the whole genome, let's say, that are annotated to that gene ontology term. And it gives you a p-value which tells you what is the probability that that pathway is actually overrepresented in your gene list and it wasn't just coincidence. To be exact, and you might want to take a deep breath here, the p-value of a pathway is the probability or chance of seeing at least x number of genes out of the total n genes in the list annotated to a particular gene set term, for example, Th1 differentiation, given the proportion of genes in the whole genome that are annotated to that gene set term. Anyways, what's important here is that the closer the p-value is to zero, the more significant the particular gene ontology term associated with the group of genes is. So the less likely this was all just by chance. Okay, let's talk a bit more about your gene set. There are many databases of gene sets out there. Some of the most widely used are Gene Ontology or GO, um, KEG or Reactome. Gene Ontology basically focuses on biological processes, KEG is more focused on metabolic pathways, and Reactome is a curated database of human molecular pathways. But gene sets are not restricted to functions. There are gene sets for diseases, which gives you groups of genes associated to different diseases, um, tissues, which gives you groups of genes expressed in specific tissues, transcription factor targets, which tells you which genes are the target of different transcription factors. The list is endless. Okay, so super important to choose well your background genes. Let's go back to our example of liver cells. If we use all the genes in the human genome as a background, 
and we perform enrichment analysis, it will probably tell us that our list of differentially expressed genes is enriched in liver function pathways. I mean, it's true, but it's not very helpful. Instead, we might want to use as a background list genes that are expressed in liver tissue and remove those that are never expressed in liver, for example, um, heart-specific genes. That way, it will tell us which specific functions of liver cells are overrepresented in our analysis. So we need to choose a custom background gene set that can be measured in the experiment. If we're dealing with liver cells, then exclude genes that are specifically expressed in other tissues. Phosphoproteomics experiments, for example, measure only proteins with one or two more phosphorylation sites. So our background gene set should only include genes encoding phosphoproteins. So basically genes that we can actually measure if we take into account how our experiment was designed. Otherwise, pathway enrichment analysis would reveal inflated p-values for general processes such as kinase signaling and protein phosphorylation. Finally, our gene list. Results from gene expression analysis often look like this. Some genes are downregulated, some are upregulated, some don't really change. Some changes are significant and some are not significant at all. If you use this list for pathway enrichment analysis, it will not take into account all that information. It will also match genes that are not even differentially expressed. So, of course, you need to first filter your results by significance and fold change to keep only differentially expressed genes, the genes of interest. Of course, the results can change a lot depending on the cutoffs you set to say what is a differentially expressed gene and what is not. Is there a more objective or unbiased way of doing this? For example, by taking into account the significance and strength of the changes, which we have anyway? Of course there is. In the next video, I will talk about gene set enrichment analysis and why it is a great pathway enrichment analysis method. And that is all for today. Squid-tastic! I hope this video gave you a clear overview of pathway enrichment analysis and how it works. If you like this video, please let me know and also let me know what other topics you would like to cover next. Have a great day and see you in the next one.